In this talk, we'll cover image-based screening exams interpreted by radiologists, who the target populations are for these screening exams, how effective these imaging-based screening exams are as judged by an independent panel of experts in primary care and preventive medicine, and how each exam's benefits compare to the potential harms their use may introduce. Half a century ago, two healthcare leaders commissioned by the World Health Organization issued a set of principles and criteria that guide screening decisions. Is the condition we're planning to screen for important? Is the natural history of the condition understood? Can the condition be treated? Does the condition have a latent or early symptomatic phase? Does a suitable test exist for that latent or early symptomatic phase? And is the test acceptable to the population? Do the physical resources exist to diagnose and treat the condition? And is the cost feasible? Is there an agreed policy on whom to treat as patients? And will the effort be a continuous ongoing initiative going forward? Ideally, we proceed with screening if the answer for each of these 10 criteria is yes. A good place to start is the first criterion. These are the top causes of death in the United States. Heart disease and cancer alone account for almost half of all deaths. Cancer is a heterogeneous pool of diseases and lung, colorectal, pancreatic, breast, and prostate cancer are the top five causes of cancer death. So these end up being the top causes of death in the United States. And potential image-based screening exams exist for many of these conditions, in addition to a few conditions that don't appear on these pie charts, like abdominal aortic aneurysms and osteoporosis. This is a table that summarizes most of the image-based screening exams currently available. However, they are of varying effectiveness as judged by the United States Preventive Services Task Force, that's the USPSTF, an independent panel of experts in primary care and preventive medicine. While some imaging-based screening tests have been assigned grades of A or B by the USPSTF and are recommended for specific populations, other image-based screening tests are of debatable benefit for which a grade of C has been assigned, and only selective use can be recommended. Some imaging-based screening exams have been assigned a grade of D and are not recommended because, for example, the aggregate harms potentially introduced to a population by workups of false positives may outweigh the benefits of catching true positives. There are also a few tests for which the USPSTF assigns a grade of I because there's not enough evidence for the USPSTF to render an informed judgment about. And there are also a few tests for which no comment is made by the USPSTF at all. Lung cancer is the top cause of cancer death in the United States. Smoking results in a 20-fold increase in relative risk for lung cancer, and 9 out of 10 lung cancers are attributable to smoking. Since many lung cancers are diagnosed at a later stage, the average 5-year survival rate for lung cancer is only around 20%. The use of non-contrast low-dose chest CT performed at least once per year is currently recommended by the USPSTF for patients at high risk for lung cancer, as defined as someone between the ages of 50 and 80 with a 20 or more pack year smoking history and who has smoked any time in the last 15 years. In 2023, the American Cancer Association recommended a more liberal criteria for high risk patients and removed the stipulation that the patient must have also smoked sometime in the last 15 years. The benefits of lung cancer screening with low-dose chest CT should be weighed against the harm that may be associated with complications that could arise during the workup of false positive screens, a workup that can occasionally involve invasive procedures such as needle lung biopsy, thoracotomy, thoracoscopy, mediastinoscopy, or bronchoscopy. 
cancer-causing effects from low-dose chest CT-associated radiation exposure should also be considered, which are estimated as a lifetime risk of one fatal cancer case per 10,000 persons screened with four rounds of LDCT, according to the Italian Lung Cancer Screening Trial, and a lifetime risk of 2.6 to 8.1 major cancers per 10,000 persons screened with 10 rounds of LDCT, according to the Continuing Observation of Smoking Subjects study. Colorectal cancer is the second most common cause of cancer death in the United States. While five-year survival rates are around 90% for localized colorectal cancers, five-year survival rates fall to 72% once regional spread has occurred and to around 15% once the colorectal cancer has metastasized. Double contrast barium enema is a colorectal screening exam traditionally performed every five years on average risk asymptomatic patients above the age of 50. After a bowel cleanse, a small tube is inserted into the patient's rectum through which a combination of barium contrast and air are gently pumped and the colon inflated. A combination of fluoroscopic and overhead x-rays are then obtained with the patient in different positions. As double contrast barium enemas have substantially lower sensitivity than modern colorectal cancer screening strategies, it has not been subjected to screening trials and its use as a screening test for colorectal cancer has been declining. CT colonography is a more modern image-based colorectal screening exam. With CT colonography, the patient completes a bowel cleanse before the day of their CT. Once they've arrived and are on the CT scanning table, a tube is inserted into the rectum through which air or carbon dioxide is gently pumped and the colon inflated, and then an enhanced abdominal pelvic CT is performed. Sometimes a muscle relaxant is also administered. The risk of bowel perforation with CT colonography is between 0 and 6 incidents per 10,000 procedures. The cancer-causing effects from CT colonography-associated radiation exposure have not been well quantified. Colorectal cancer screening using CT colonography is generally performed at 5-year intervals, and it's currently recommended by the USPSTF for average risk asymptomatic patients 45 to 75 years of age. Because of the long average time between adenoma development and cancer diagnosis, the likelihood that early detection and early intervention will yield a mortality benefit tends to decline after age 75. Because of the lower benefit to harm ratio for CT colonography in patients above age 75, the USPSTF does not recommend routine CT colonography screening in asymptomatic adults from 75 to 85 years of age, and they recommend against screening in asymptomatic adults older than 85 years of age who have previously been adequately screened. Pancreatic cancer is the third most common cause of cancer death in the United States. Five-year survival rates for pancreatic cancer currently sit at 9% and its risk factors are not well understood. Some folks have proposed the use of contrast-enhanced abdominal CT to screen for pancreatic cancer in people with genetic syndromes associated with pancreatic cancer or with a family history of pancreatic cancer. However, the USPSTF has thus far found no evidence that screening for pancreatic cancer or treating screen-detected pancreatic cancer improves disease-specific morbidity or mortality or all-cause mortality. Based on this, the unknown accuracy of enhanced abdominal CT for pancreatic cancer screening, the poor prognosis for pancreatic cancer even when treated at an early stage, and the potential harms introduced by working up false positive screens, the USPSTF recommends against pancreatic cancer screening with enhanced abdominal CT. For similar reasons, the USPSTF also recommends against pancreatic cancer screening with abdominal MRI and MRCP. Breast cancer is the second most common cause of cancer death in American women. While five-year survival rates are very high when breast cancer is discovered while still localized, five-year survival rates fall to 28% in cases where the breast cancer has already metastasized. 2D mammography has been offered 
for breast cancer screening for many years, though there are varying opinions on whether mammography should be performed annually or biennially, and at what age screening should begin. To best answer these questions, the benefits of breast cancer screening with 2D mammography need to be balanced against the number of unnecessary breast biopsies resulting from false positive screens, in addition to the concept of overdiagnosis. Overdiagnosis refers to the diagnosis and treatment of indolent breast cancer cases that would never have become a threat to a woman's health or even apparent during their lifetime. The benefits of screening also need to be balanced against the potential risk of inducing breast cancer due to the repeated radiation exposure associated with multiple rounds of mammography. Based on information from the Digital Mammography Imaging Screening Trial, in the setting of biennial screening in women aged 50 to 74 years of age, the mean lifetime attributable risk of developing breast cancer from mammography screening is 2 to 6 cases per 10,000 women screened, and the mean lifetime attributable risk of breast cancer death is 0.4 to 1 deaths per 10,000 women screened. Based on these considerations, the USPSTF recommends biennial breast cancer screening with conventional 2D mammography in women between 50 and 74 years of age. And the USPSTF states that breast cancer screening with conventional 2D mammography in women between 40 to 49 years of age should be an individual decision. While screening can resist, while screening can reduce the risk for breast cancer death in women in their 40s, the number of deaths averted is fewer than in older women, and the number of false positive results and unnecessary biopsies tends to be greater. However, women with a family history of breast cancer are at higher risk for breast cancer and may benefit more than average risk women who begin screening in their 40s. There is also insufficient evidence on the effectiveness of mammography screening in women 75 years or older, according to the USPSTF, and the balance of benefits and harms introduced by screening is therefore unknown. Digital breast tomosynthesis is an imaging technique often performed in combination with conventional 2D mammography at the present time, and basically doubles the radiation exposure to a patient. Newer processes exist that can generate synthetic reconstructions of 2D mammography images from the tomosynthesis views and can therefore reduce a patient's radiation dose. However, data on the performance of digital breast tomosynthesis with synthetic 2D mammo images is limited. This limited data does, however, suggest that digital breast tomosynthesis increases breast cancer detection rates and reduces recall rates for additional imaging or testing when compared with conventional 2D mammography alone. However, it's not known what number of these additional cases of breast cancer detected would have become clinically significant and what number of these additional cases are over diagnosis. Therefore, the USPS currently believes that there is insufficient evidence to ascertain the, the balance of benefits versus harms associated with the use of digital breast tomosynthesis for breast cancer screening and has currently assigned it an I grade. Although limited data suggests that adjunctive breast cancer screening with ultrasound can detect additional breast cancers in women who have dense breasts, most positive ultrasound breast screening tests are false positives, and therefore adjunctive breast cancer screening with ultrasound is currently assigned an I grade by the USPSTF. Limited data also suggests that adjunctive breast cancer screening with MRI can also detect additional breast cancers in women who have dense breasts. However, like with breast ultrasound, a large number of positive MRI screening test results are false positives, and therefore, adjunctive breast cancer screening with MRI is also currently assigned an I grade by the USPSTF. Prostate cancer is the third most common cause of cancer death in men, though five-year prostate cancer survival rates currently approach 100%. Many prostate cancers may in fact be clinically silent, 
as post-mortem biopsy studies have revealed the presence of prostate cancer in over a third of all men 70 to 79 years of age. Some folks have proposed the use of contrast-enhanced prostate MRI and targeted biopsy of abnormal appearing prostate regions to screen men with abnormal PSAs. However, both the risks from biopsy complications and substantial overdiagnosis are significant. The USPSTF currently makes no comment regarding prostate cancer screening with MRI. Hepatocellular carcinoma, or HCC, is the fourth leading cause of cancer death worldwide and associated with a five year survival rate of only 18%. Alcoholic cirrhosis, chronic hepatitis infection, and NASH are known risk factors. The use of semi annual ultrasound has been proposed for HCC screening in people with known risk factors for HCC, as has the use of abbreviated non contrast liver MRI. With both tests, how the benefits of image based screening compared to potential harms from the workup of false positives remains unclear, and the USPSTF has issued no statement regarding either modality. Ovarian cancer is the leading cause of gynecologic cancer death and the fifth most common cause overall of cancer death in women. Although five-year survival rates for localized ovarian cancer are relatively favorable, many cases are only diagnosed after ovarian cancer has metastasized, resulting in five-year survival rates of around 30%. Annual transvaginal ultrasound has been performed, sorry, annual transvaginal ultrasound has been proposed for ovarian cancer screening in both postmenopausal women and in women over the age of 25 with a family history of ovarian cancer. However, three large good quality studies have all found that annual screening in asymptomatic women not known to be at high risk for ovarian cancer had no effect on ovarian cancer mortality. Ovarian cancer screening is currently associated with significant downsides. Workup of false positive screens may sometimes require the removal of one or both ovaries and fallopian tubes and the surgery required is associated with a not insignificant risk of postoperative complications. For these reasons, the USPSTF recommends against ovarian cancer screening with transvaginal ultrasound. Thyroid cancer is a more uncommon cancer compared to the ones we've discussed so far and associated with a 98% five-year survival rate. That said, some folks have proposed the use of annual ultrasound for thyroid cancer screening in people with known risk factors for thyroid cancer. However, the benefits of thyroid cancer screening remain unproven. Although the potential harms from thyroid cancer screening are not well understood, neither are its benefits. No studies directly comparing the outcomes of screening versus no screening exist, and no randomized control trials comparing early thyroid cancer treatment versus observation exist either. As a consequence, the USPSTF recommends against thyroid cancer screening with ultrasound at the present time. Osteoporosis is an indirect cause of death in a large number of Americans. Present in over 12 million people over age 50, Osteoporotic hip fractures are a feared outcome. Occurring mostly in women, osteoporotic hip fractures cause substantial morbidity, not to mention loss of independence and quality of life. In fact, about a quarter of patients with an osteoporotic hip fracture die within one year. Fortunately, convincing evidence exists that drug therapies can reduce fracture rates in postmenopausal women. Measurement of bone mineral density using dual energy x ray absorptiometry or DEXA scans of the lumbar spine and hip or of the forearm and heel are common imaging based screening tests for osteoporosis. Treating screen detected osteoporosis has been proven to provide at least moderate benefit in avoiding fractures, and the potential harms associated with pharmacological osteoporosis treatment are relatively small. As a consequence, the USPSTF recommends osteoporosis screening with DEXA imaging in women age 65 and over, and also 
in younger postmenopausal women with similar fracture risk. There is insufficient data on the relative benefits versus harm, however, for the use of DEXA screening in men. Quantitative ultrasound is an alternative imaging technique for osteoporosis screening that can be used at peripheral anatomic sites like the calcaneus and does not require radiation exposure like DEXA. However, quantitative ultrasound does not measure bone mineral density, which is the method by which osteoporosis is directly defined and the criteria most osteoporosis drug therapy trials require for study inclusion. Quantitative CT is another alternative imaging-based osteoporosis screening test that can estimate the average bone mineral density of several lumbar vertebral bodies on CT imaging. At present, however, the USPSTF has issued no statement regarding either alternative screening modality for osteoporosis. Heart disease is the top cause of death in the United States, surpassing cancer. Its associations are well known. For the last few decades, there has been substantial interest in using coronary calcium CT scoring as a screening tool to help improve outcomes in patients between 40 and 75 years of age with an intermediate risk for a major adverse cardiovascular event. With coronary calcium screening, a non-contrast CT of the heart is performed and a score tallied for that reflects both the amount and the density of coronary artery calcifications present. In its analysis of coronary calcium CT scoring, the USPSTF recommends against its use for screening patients with low risk for a major adverse cardiovascular event. The USPSTF has also found inadequate evidence to assess whether treatment decisions should be guided by coronary calcium score in patients at increased risk of a major adverse cardiovascular event. A randomized control trial deemed to be of fair quality in asymptomatic patients with no history of cardiovascular event appeared to show that the use of coronary calcium scoring resulted in no difference in major adverse cardiovascular events after four years, though the study appeared to be underpowered. The USPSTF found no trials evaluating the additional benefit of adding coronary artery calcium score to traditional risk assessment models for guiding decisions about specific interventions to prevent cardiovascular events. Two other studies found that screening with coronary artery calcium score was not superior to traditional risk management for preventive medication use or risk factor management. The radiation exposure involved in coronary artery scoring CT is relatively low, and the main potential harm from coronary calcium screening are potential complications that may occur during invasive diagnostic procedures, such as coronary angiography, required during the workup of some positive screens. Cerebrovascular events are a leading cause of disability and death. Asymptomatic carotid artery stenosis is a risk factor for stroke, though it is responsible for a fairly small proportion of all strokes. Nonetheless, there has been considerable interest in image-based screening for carotid artery disease. The use of grayscale and Doppler ultrasound in patients with a history of TIA or CVA, or in patients with neurological symptoms referable to the carotid arteries, has been proposed. However, there is inadequate evidence to assess whether its use should be recommended or not by the USPSTF in such higher-risk patients. No studies exist that directly examine the health benefits or harms of screening with carotid ultrasound. However, carotid ultrasound is a study known for frequent false positive results and its use for carotid artery screening in patients without a history of TIA, CVA, or neurological symptoms referable to the carotid arteries is not recommended by the USPSTF. For similar reasons, there is inadequate evidence to assess whether carotid CTA or carotid MRA should be recommended or not by the USPSTF in higher risk patients. However, the USPSTF does not recommend carotid CTA or MRA as a screening test in low risk patients with no history of TIA, CVA, or patients with a neurologic symptom referable to the carotid arteries. Finally, 
Ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysms are a condition associated with a high mortality rate, but are often clinically silent until rupture occurs. The risk of rupture is associated with aneurysm size, and abdominal aortic ultrasound performed is a common imaging-based screening exam for SSS. Its use is recommended by the USPSTF for men between 65 and 75 years of age and with a smoking history. While there is inadequate evidence to assess whether its use should be recommended or not by the USPSTF in women of the same age with the same smoking history. Ultrasound screening of AAAs in male non-smokers 65 to 75 years of age should be handled on a case-by-case basis, while its use in female non-smokers is not recommended. In summary, the USPSTF recommends low-dose chest CT for patients at high risk for lung cancer, and the USPSTF recommends CT colonoscopy for colorectal cancer screening, 2D mammography for breast cancer screening, DEXA scans for osteoporosis screening, and abdominal aortic ultrasound for AAA screening in some, but not all, populations. Based on a moderate or high certainty of no net benefit, the USPSTF currently recommends against image-based screening for diseases such as pancreatic cancer, ovarian cancer, thyroid cancer, or stroke, and they appear skeptical about the use of coronary calcium CT scoring. Lastly, the USPSTF provides no comment regarding screening tests like double contrast barium enema, prostate MR, liver ultrasound, liver MRI, or quantitative bone ultrasound and CT all of which finally leave us with a vetted matrix of imaging-based screening exams that end up looking like this, which hopefully is the suite of imaging-based screening exams your radiology department offers.